beta oxidation. And so beta oxidation is really cool. I like it. It's only four steps. It's just the way that it gets repeated. And this is our first spiral. I thought it was great. It's probably towards acetyl CoA. <coughs> acetyl CoA is the ultimate goal here. And that, well, it's, it's sort of like, you know how in the SAT they do, what is it called? The analogies like black is to olive, like orange is to, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, uh, pyruvate is to glycolysis, while acetyl CoA is to beta oxidation. So, that kind of thing. <coughs> like orange is to orange? I shouldn't, I should have thought that one through. That was my worst part of the SAT, for the whole SAT part. You know, my, my use of English is very limited, so. All right. So, we have beta oxidation. It's going to degrade fatty acids, in particular, down two carbons at a time, okay, to make acetyl-CoA. So I want you to think about, and I think I've already put Oh, by the way, I, the video is up on my fire. It took a long time to get it around. This goes neither here nor there. And then so is the part one PowerPoint without the boxes that should already be available. At least I can see. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So, but the part two, I haven't, because we haven't gone through all the parts. So, why is it important for acetyl CoA? Where do the products go from there? And then once again, where, why do you suppose it's called beta? Oxidation. So why is it important? What is the importance of acetyl CoA? CoA? Where does what's the if you're under the conditions for acetyl to for beta oxidation to occur, where primarily where will that acetyl CoA go? Citric acid, Citric acid cycle. Okay. Because are you going to be doing beta oxidation when you need energy or when you have too much energy already? When you need energy. Same reason why you go into the citric acid cycle. Okay. Um, oh, and I meant it. Some people had contacted me concerning glucagon versus insulin with respect to energy, um, relative energy levels. I forgot how it was worded. It was worded best. But insulin, this insulin occur when you have high, when your blood sugar is higher or lower? It's, it's in response to high blood sugar, so that means you already have met your energetic needs at that time, like you just, just, just had, you have just eaten, you just had it in the bond, whether you want to depend it or not, right? Your insulin spikes, you've got plenty of energy overall for your body, that's why the cells can internalize the blood sugar in order to do whatever it needs to do, whether it needs it for glycolysis and, or lipids and that kind of stuff, which technically it's usually going to be depending upon the cell type, will usually go for storage if you have too much, with the exception maybe being like the liver, because the liver, remember, it doesn't undergo glycolysis on its own until everything else is taken care of. Okay. Whereas glucagon typically have low blood sugar. If you think of it with respect to your blood serum, that means you need energy. So therefore, you're going to kick up um, the, the other, okay, the other pathways. Because so you need to get the energy out. Your blood sugar is low. So you're just think your brain doesn't have enough sugar, so therefore we're going to have to start to uh, make sure that it gets, and gets released versus gets internal, getting internalized. All right, that's the new thing right there. All right, so where did the products go from here? It goes from the citric acid cycle. Why do you suppose it's called beta oxidation? Where did, what did the beta refer to? Pardon? Is it the carbon? The carbon. So if we just review from organic chemistry, <laughs> or from this last hour of enzymology, <laughs> you know, these are fatty acids from last semester. So on and so forth, of course it goes on and on and on, or it could go on and on and on. Where would the beta carbon be? Oops, I've got the negative charge there. The second from the right. The second from the right, so you're seeing this one right here? Is that going to be alpha or beta? Alpha. That one's alpha because, once again, this is not a scientific term. I call that one the ground zero carbon. If you use numbered locants, it's carbon number one. So beta is actually carbon number three. Um, but that's ground zero, so this one's alpha. So that one right there would be beta. Okay. <clears throat> and it does. It lets you know what's occurring at carbon number three overall of beta carbon. If it's beta oxidation, it's being oxidized. Yeah, don't, over, don't, over, don't overthink it. 
All right, <clears throat> so here we go. Beta oxidation, just four steps, and then it spirals. Because if you start off with 16 carbons, you, by the end, you're going to get rid of two in the form of acetyl CoA, so you're left with 14. Then you go again, you're going to be left with 12 plus another acetyl CoA. Then again, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so I want you to look at this. And this can also make sense why you get so much energy ultimately out of, beta, uh, out of this process. So, what's that? Oh, that's not pretty. All right. So, here we go. This is already, already has it written out for you. This is, notice, why does it say, why does it say acyl CoA? What's the importance of acyl? It's however long. You know, if you have like arachidonic acid, it's 20, 20? 20. Um, so, versus... Steric, I think it's 16. There, there's lots. I don't have you guys memorized. There's only one at the end that I'll have you memorized because of its common name is really important. Um, otherwise, I don't have you memorized. <clears throat> like steric, oleic, lean, oleic, lean, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And notice it's got the coenzyme A is already attached. So we have the acyl CoA, we have FAD. Out of it, we get FADH and the trans enoyl CoA. So that's why whenever I asked you if trans fats are naturally occurring, it's like no with a little asterisk. This is the asterisk, okay? Because yes, we do get a trans fat here in the step, but it does not leave the enzyme. You don't have, assuming you're healthy and your enzyme, something weird's not going on, it's going, it's going to stay here. So you don't have to worry about the trans fat being released into your serum. Okay? Versus if you get a trans fat from your diet, Right. Anyway, we get FADH2. <clears throat> so what class or classes of enzymes can this be? It's dehydrogenase. Let's see, once I told you, once you know the... So this one is a dehydrogenase. And we know that because, what's the giveaway on that one? The FAD to FADH2. Now, if you're going to name this one, what can you name this one? One would be an enoyl CoA dehydrogenase. What's another one? Acyl CoA dehydrogenase. And this one is an acyl CoA dehydrogenase. So I told you that the names really aren't, well, many of the names aren't that, that bad. It appears that the majority of the enzyme would go by the first, like by the. You, if you have to reactive, guess, if you have to guess, once in a while, like pyruvic kinase. And I don't, especially pyruvic kinase, it doesn't go, go backwards, it's named backwards, I don't know. It'd be a historical artifact. Okay. We had to guess. Mm -hmm. so there's no other reason why it's chosen to go to oxygen. For pyruvic kinase or the, was it succinyl CoA synthetase? Yeah. No, I think I don't know. I would say probably based off of whenever it was first characterized, it probably isolated it going backwards or something. Right. Historically, because there are a few painful ones that you hear about that way. Or if they had named it the other direction, if. Um, so, for example, the epimerase, that one epimerase, if it goes one direction, it's called the glucose epimerase, if it goes the other way, it's the galactose. And so sometimes if it would, would cause con being confusing, then maybe they didn't do But did you have a question? Is it just describing what's happening? Like, the, if, like the, with the, which name it chooses, it looks like it's just dehydrogenating the acyl CoA. Right. And so remember, dehydrogenate. When we say dehydrogenating, uh, it, it's not because it's losing a hydrogen, it's because it has to do with the redox reaction. The hydrogens are just, mm -hmm. technically it's a hydride, so that's why you can't just say H plus because it's not the H plus here, especially with FADH. And by the way, FADH2 can go on to make up to 1.5 ATPs, whereas NADH can go up to make 2.0, up to, up to make, I cannot speak today, can go up to make as many as 2.5 ATPs, mole for mole ratio. Now, this is why, where, so why is this called trans enoyl? The CoA is because it's got coenzyme A attached to it. What's the trans indicate? Right, the trans versus cis. Okay. And that one's pretty easy the way they have drawn it's trans. What's enoyl? 
That's one that you probably have forgotten about from organic chemistry. Where does the in oil come from? Uh, kind of, mm-hmm. So if we go back, the in part indicates what? A double bond, and so an alkene. So we're just going to do this way, All right? So that'd be the ene. Okay. Then we have another. Uh, if you have this, and actually, if we just have that one, so we, and you don't have to worry. And the hydrogens are there. We're not worried about that. If you were going to name that carboxylic gas, do you remember what you would call it? If it if it didn't have the double bond in it. And it's got three carbons, what would it be called? No, it's carboxylic acid, but what would be the specific name for that carboxylic acid? Three carbons means? Propane. Pro propane, if it didn't have the carboxylic acid. Now if you put the carboxylic acid on it, it's called? Propanoic. Propanoic acid, right? And then what happens is if you add the double bond, instead it goes from being propanoic acid to? Propenoic acid, right? Technically, um, if, if it was like butenoic acid, then you'd have to put the low camp stuff. With propenoic acid, you can only have one low camp. So, I mean, there, there is no, it has to be carbon or two. Now, if you go from a carboxylic, if you think back to the rules for carboxylic acids and carboxylic acid derivatives, like if this was an ester, let's say that we put a methyl group on it. What happens to the ending here? It becomes the YL. And so if it, if it was propenoic acid, and we put the methyl, it becomes methyl propenoate, right? You have to have that. Or they would call it a propenoyl group. So literally what that means is this is an alkene that was a part of that carboxylic acid, and now it's attached to coenzyme A. So that's what the oil part. And so it comes from, same thing with the amides and all that kind of stuff. It comes back, even they, they do the same thing with the dioesters. I just let you know, the E means it's double bond. The Y L means it's attached. And originally, the, the O is a carryover from the using carboxylic acid, the carboxylate. <clears throat> okay. Whoops. So now we have reaction two. Sorry, I went too far. We have the trans oil CoA. We take a water, we smack it with the water to make it. I don't remember. You remember these are this is a beta hydroxy ester. So technically it's a beta hydroxy thioester since we have a salt in there. But they have special properties if you think back to organic chemistry. <clears throat> okay. So first of all, we've done an oxidation reaction here of beta carbon. It, so we, we are oxidizing it. What class or classes of enzymes can this be? If you're adding a water, it's a hydratase. You're hydrating it. So if we were going to name it, what would you name it? Trans enoil coa. coa. Yes, it's enoil coa hydrase. If you put the trans on there, that's that's fine too. Yes. I told you the name's not not too hard. It makes sense. The big thing is, once again, you just have to remember that most of these have those generic names like acyl, enoil, because they really do take a wide variety of substrates for each round, right? From 20 to 18 to 16 to 14. Uh, the name here should make sense. I'm not so worried about the standard chemistry that you know as well. Um, but it, it is going to be an anterior specific. But the beta hydroxy acyl CoA, it's still an acyl group. It still has a coenzyme A on it. It has an alcohol, which remember those are called hydroxy. Whenever they don't have the top priority, they're called the hydroxy group. And it's on the beta carbon. So there's ground zero, alpha, beta. So that's why it's called beta hydroxy.
hydroxyacyl-CoA. <clears throat> so here's reaction three. We oxidize it once again. So it goes from beta hydroxy acyl CoA to beta keto acyl CoA. Hopefully, you see the pattern here that's going on. You have an NAD going to NADH. Or you can go make up up to how many ATPs? 2.5. And that will make sense. I think it's in chapter 20 when we figure out the. And that's a question that I, many times I have asked on quizzes or exams. Why does FADH2 only make 1.5? NADH can make up to 2.5. They don't be surprised if you don't see that later on. What was that question again? Why NADH can make up to 2.5 ATPs, molar ratio, whereas FADH2 can only make 1.5 ATPs. Don't worry, I stress it again in that chapter. But I said it, I've been stressing it all semester long. Actually, probably instead of last semester, turn two. So, what class or classes of enzymes can this be? What? Say it. Dehydrogenase. And if you're going to name it, don't be wishy washy. Don't make me do my, you know, faith integration on that one. Look what it says for the lukewarm wishy washiness guy will spew out of your mouth. Uh, not out of your mouth, out of his mouth. It would be what specific one? Yes, yeah, so this is beta hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase. So we're almost there. We're almost where we need to be. We have our beta keto group once again. The, the beta position has special properties. Sort of the alpha position with respect to these ketone, uh, the, these carbonyl based things like esters and, and carboxylic acids and thioesters. Just to do a quick review from organic chemistry, these hydrogens typically have a much lower P, pKa than what you would expect. Just because of the fact that they are stuck between, um, it, you can oxidize the beta carbons just because of the properties we have here, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> All right, so then finally we only have one, one reaction left. We have beta keto acyl CoA. We have another coenzyme A. We actually utilize a lot of coenzyme A in this part, which makes sense since ultimately we're making a lot of acetyl CoA. And it comes in, it cleaves, it does that cleaves it into reverse Kleisen reaction. If you need to, you can go back to organic chemistry. To look up like those Kaiser reactions and stuff like that. Uh, what that means. And then it makes another acyl CoA, but it has two carbons fewer than the last time. And then we have acetyl CoA. What enzyme could this be? This one is the one that's got the special name. You know how we have like enolase and aldolase and fumarase. I was like, I know there's another one. There's another one that we get. Enolase, aldolase, fumarase, and aconitase. There's this ace. It's not called this ace before you read that. <laughs> this ace, no. Um, so what are some of the functional groups that we have around here? Like you know how we have enol, enolase, and Aldols and aldolase. Oh, there's ketones. So we can see a ketone. What else do we have? Thiol. And this is thiol. Okay, notice there's a little asterisk. Keep the, you can either write it down or you can keep it in your mind, mind's eye or what have you. This is the thiol. We're going to see, notice it, it shows, all of these show the enzyme only going one direction. That's because. Uh, the reversal of this process is not just a reversal of beta oxidation, the way it's made. We will see this enzyme again, though. Even though it shows in this process, this enzyme is only going one way, 
we actually can see it go the other direction in a different metabolic pathway. But no, this, this one's named after the thiol. So what do you suppose its name is going to be? It's thiolase. So, yeah, and like I said, we can act, it, it does do the reverse. It's just not in this pathway it does the reverse reaction. Does that make sense? It's actually an enzyme that's used in more than one pathway. <coughs> So it's thiolase, like I said, that's the only one. All the other ones are like the traditional naming systems. Uh, if you look up the Enzyme Commission terminology, I'm sure that they give it a very specific name. I would not expect you to know that name. A lot of times they're named after like both substrates and, you know, they have those names that have like 40 letters and that kind of thing. But they're very, very descriptive. <clears throat> okay, so if we look at the entire process here, like I said, it's a big spiral. So we can see where, uh, if we start off with 18, let's see. If we start off with 18 carbon, so octadecan, you know, that means eight plus 10, 18, which is a common name of steric acid. If you start off with 18, please note, it only goes through eight cycles. That's another question I have asked in the, in the past, you know, giving you how many total carbons it is, like how many times it goes through the oxidation. Why doesn't it go through nine? It's one of those like, like what, when you sit and think about it, you're like, no, no duh. You know, but then afterwards, like, just ask how many times when something with 18 carbons goes through, 90% of the time people say, well, nine. But it's actually only eight. Why? Because you're left with acetyl-CoA at the end. Yeah, at the end, when you have four, that last time you get two acetyl-CoA is out. So if this had 20, it would be, instead of 10, it's gonna be nine. If it had 14, instead of seven, it's gonna be six times around. And so you just have to kind of think that through. I don't necessarily mean it to be a trick question, but, but that's why, if you look here, we have 18, but since it goes eight times, you get out of it eight NADHs and eight FADH2s, you get nine acetyl-CoA's, each of those NADHs can go up to make 2.5, so nine, uh, sorry, eight times 2.5, eight times two is 16 plus the 0.5, you got 20. Yeah. 20 ATPs for NADH, you know, she, so it, there's a lot that you get out of it. The acetyl-CoA is going to the citric acid cycle, citric acid cycle can go on to make more equivalents, and so it's, it, there's a lot of energy you get from it. <clears throat> This is what it looks like. It's a little easier to see. I also like this figure, you know, from the old one because the thiolase just little scissors to cut the cleavage. <clears throat> oh, and I also want to point out, like this one, don't be surprised if you see that delta sign. You know, the other one may just call it enoil coa or trans enoil coa. That delta lets you know. Does you remember from from organic chemistry what that delta means? It lets you know where the double bond is occurring. So the double bond is occurring between, you know, it starts at carbon number two. So carbon one, carbon two. That's why it's called delta two. Okay. <clears throat> we can see it around. Um, all right. This is just another way of showing it. Ooh. I, whoops, sorry. I don't remember what, I don't remember this video. So. <laughs> so it, it, it won't work on this app anyways. I do know we had one group many, 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 many years ago, back when we did the videos, that did a beta oxidation video. It's very catchy. It's not very aesthetically pleasing because they just did it in, against the wall in Poland, I think. So it's just the words of, the, of their song going up the wall as they sing. But it's, it's one that if you learn it, it's get stuck in your head. Because I think it's from the, that teen teen song. But, okay. Uh, where the products go? Why is it important? We've already discussed this. You know, acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle. Where does, I haven't specifically said, but where does the NADH and the FADH2 go? Pardon? The electron transport chain. Now, if you knew exactly what part of the electron transport chain that it went into, 
you guys won't see bonus points. So, yeah. but, especially for FADH too. And so, what? You're gonna, you're gonna learn something about that. All right, so this was the, the generic fatty acids. Now what about the unsaturated? You know, those good fats we all hear about, those monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, the PUFAs and all that kind of stuff. Pardon? I'm assuming this ends with hiccup. They would. Hiccup, that's a good word for it. Oh yeah, there's a hiccup. It does require a couple of different reactions. Because, well, what's, what are the, nat the naturally occurring unsaturated fatty acids? The naturally occurring ones. What's one of the problem? I mean, what, what kind of unsaturated fats are they? We just went through beta oxidation. They're cis. You notice that was trans. So it's not like you could just jump in, you know, on set two or whatever. No, it's, it's trans. And so, versus cis and everything. So it's going to require different. So this is oleic acid, which ole oil, coa. That's a, so it's a double bond between carbon nine and ten. But see, I don't expect you to memorize the numbers. Now, if you go back to that chapter ten, the way that we talked about the you know like sixteen colon zero or sixteen colon one delta nine, I would expect you to be able to draw it then. What happens is it undergoes, so ole oil, it's hard to say, uh, does normal oxidation until that double bond is two carbons away. Okay. But then it cannot go through the enoil oil to a hydrotase because it's only a trans, that, that recognizes trans fats and these are cis fats. So you have to have this helper enzyme to convert it to trans. All right, so here we go. Whoops, that's not it. So I want you to try to get, figure out what's going on. And think it through. So the way that this literally reads is, we know we start off, we have the 18, it's just, it's got the, the double bond. It goes through oxidation three times, but now it's where it's gonna get stuck because the double bond, the cis double bond is on the beta carbon. <coughs> so instead of being a trans delta whatever, it's cis delta three, and then that literally means 12, you know, 2 plus 10. And we're going to tr transform it. I don't want to say the right, the right word. Uh, we're going to change it from a cis to a trans fat. <clears throat> so what class or classes of enzymes can do this? This is an isomerase. You know, if you had said mutase, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, this one specifically is an isomerase. <clears throat> Here's where it gets tricky. Naming this isomerase. <laughs> what do they have in common? <laughs> Between the cis delta three do desinoil or actually, I'll just say cis delta three acyl or acyl enoil, if you wanted to call it that. Remember that the, the number here is in the form of CoA and the trans delta two acyl enoil CoA. What did they have in common? The enoil CoA part, right? <clears throat> so that's in there. It's enoil CoA isomerase. But now we have to be a little bit more specific. What? Positions is it isomerizing? Right, that, that those carbons two and three. And so we put that all together. That's why once you see this name, this name is ugly because you know we don't read in Greek letters too often. 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just me. Maybe I saw that and said, it looks great to me. It is hot. But <laughs> it'll sink in. I'm glad. <laughs> but it, it, it's saying Delta 3, Delta 2, E Noil, Coe, Summaries. If you'd said E Sol, E Noil, Delta 3, Delta 2, E Sol, E Noil, Coe, it summaries people would understand what we're talking about as well. <clears throat> okay. The Delta 3, Delta 2 just shows you the two positions that are being, by summarizing, <laughs> being, you know, changed. You do the delta, because delta just shows you it means that line. Whereas if you just said two, three, you know, technically if you said two, th two comma three, you know what, okay, uh, people probably would wonder, like, what does that mean? Because literally that means one double bond, you have two low cants. Mm -hmm. And so that probably would be some confusion. Now if you said two, three, Dighton oil, then that means you're two double bonds. Chances are people would understand enough that you pick it up out of the context. All right, but now, now it's in the correct location, so you can just go ahead and go through and do normal beta oxidation just like before. <clears throat> Backwards. All right, so how are we doing? Time. All right, so right now, what we're going to do is I'm just going to talk a little bit about polyunsaturated fatty acids before we talk about the quiz. All right, I haven't forgotten about the quiz. So these are the PUFAs, you know, polyunsaturated fatty acids, the little these were related. And there are two problems with this. One of them has to do with cis and trans. And another one, which is actually the, at least for me, and, and by the way, it's supposed to be beta oxidation, and whenever it switched over, it, it took away the beta. Um, the, the more difficult for me had to do with the location. For me personally, it was the location. What mean, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, <clears throat> location of double bonds. And so where does that double bond need to be at in order for the normal spiral to continue? And it requires two, okay? Rather than trying to rush the, that in right now, I thought I'll go ahead and stop here. Are